You went now listening to British Brothers, the True Crime Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the true crime podcast focusing exclusively on British murder cases and serial killers. I'm your host Stuart Blues and I have David McKelvey with me. Welcome David. Hi Stuart. How can I introduce you? Can I introduce you as a a 1920s detective private eye from film noir? What's the best way to introduce you? Uh, uh, Retired in 2010 from the Metropolitan Police. And uh, I suppose since then, uh, I suppose you'd call us a private investigations company, but we, we do policing, I suppose. We investigate everything from shoplifting all the way up to and including murders. Oh, so the company is called TMI. I love that name, by the way. TMI. Yep. The TM space, the word I for anyone that's listening. Yep. Not too much information. Came out in 2007, right? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, I was still a serving detective, uh, detective chief inspector in the Met in 2007, set it up as a business interest. And yeah, I retired in 2010, all for us business interest. And what we used to do in the old days when before I retired was we just looked at the issues and problems of counterfeit goods in the marketplace. And then when I retired in 2010, we then started doing proactive work around counterfeit goods. So when did you first join the police? What was it, 1980, was it then, based on what you've said? Yeah, yeah, 82, 19 February, 18th of February, or 15th of February, 1982, first day at Hendon. How did you get into that career? Long story, of, of my grandfather was a policeman, but the, there, was, there was a single event, really, that sort of pushed me down that road, which was um, bizarrely in a nightclub one night, I saw a, a man getting severely beaten and felt like I needed to do something or wanted to do something and just stood there watching it. And at the end of it, I sort of sat down and thought, well, how do you make a difference? And it was literally the next day I I went away and um, got the papers and um, made my application to join the police. How long did the process take before you joined? Oh God, back then, probably about nine months. You, you know, you were visited by uh, police officers who come round to, you know, check up on your house, your background. You, you were thoroughly vetted back then. You know, I know there's all this issue at the moment going on with the, the police at the moment. But back then, you know, there was a very, very stringent vetting programme. And then once you got through that, you had obviously medicals and exams and everything else. And then eventually you would get to Hendon. And I think we spent the first 18 weeks living at Hendon, uh, you know, marching every morning off to classes. It was a very, very disciplined service back then. Very, very different to what it is now. So is Hendon like a, a, an academy? Yeah, I mean, it was a huge estate. Three big tower blocks on the estate, running pitches. There was over the other side, there was a driving centre. It was a, a huge estate back then that was solely for the training of police officers as recruits, all the way through detectives, all of the supervisory ranks. Everything went through Hendon, effectively, back then. And that system worked. You know, you you produce good, hard-working, vocational police officers. And, you know, within that, you also then went on to become detectives and went to detective training school there as well, where, you, you know, my detective course, my initial course was 10 weeks, and then you would learn to become a detective they gave you the tools to do the job do you remember your first day on the job whether it was just as a you started as a constable i assume yeah yeah you all started well, in those days you used to start as a constable i remember my first day at hendon obviously that's a you know leaving home going to hendon the night before and, and that's the start of your you know you lived there and, and um stayed there every single week and then came out, I can't watch, well, I came out literally sort of 20 weeks later, went to Stoke Newington, which at the time was probably one of the roughest police stations to go to, one of the busiest. And you were thrown out on the streets with your uniform on, your hat, you know, your helmet on, and uh, you were put out on the streets, uh, puppy walked by a, a more experienced officer. And that was it. You spent your days on the streets patrolling old fashioned beats as such. 
but walking the streets, meeting people, talking to people, learning to communicate with people. And that's what policing is all about. I like that term being puppy walked. A few of the ex-coppers I've had on a view that always makes me laugh. Where is that area then? Stoke, what did you say? Sorry, my, my geography is not great. Stoke Newton was um, is Hackney, basically. Okay. They, back then you had, um, you, you had a very different structure to policing. And so you had divisions and the division, which was then called G Division, was Hackney Police Station, City Road, Stoke Newington and Dalston. So they were the four sort of police stations within G District. What level did you leave the force at? What was your rank? I retired as a detective chief inspector. And I retired at uh, Enfield. Okay. So what were you in charge of then? Were you in charge of just that station or were you in charge of a few? How does it work being a DCI? So by that time, uh, as a DCI, I was in charge of the CID effectively, the CID portfolio. So there was two sides to the CID. You had the reactive CID and you had the proactive teams. Back then, the CID was both proactive and reactive. It's not so much so now. It's predominantly reactive now. So a crime gets reported, it gets investigated. Back then, and really, that's where I, I was more successful, was around the proactive side of things. So getting out on the streets and catching people doing or committing crimes. That's where I think the police have not failed, but they've moved away from proactive policing. And it's far better if you catch someone before they commit a crime or while they're committing a crime, if you catch them, convict them, then that's going to prevent crime. You know, instead of, you know, they go on to commit 30, 50, 100, 200 burglaries and you're running around trying to investigate all those burglaries. If you've caught them in the first place, you prevented them. And that's where policing has moved away from that proactive stance. What effect has that had on, I suppose, not only criminals nowadays, but also communities? Well, you know, it's something we see day in, day out, and that's why we've been very successful in the in the private sector because there is a disconnect with the public and you know if you go back to when i left in 2010 you know the clear up rate so you would catch people committing crimes you prosecute and convict them and you know we had some of the highest clear up rates in the met at the time you know in excess of 20 percent so people were getting caught for committing burglaries robberies and motor vehicle crimes etc and we prioritise those offences. I think where we are now is they've lost that. They've lost a bit of the public support because they're not, you know, it's been well publicised. They're not turning up to investigate burglaries. They're not turning up or dealing with motor vehicle crimes and that type of stuff, the stuff that really impacts on the public. And as a result of that, you've got a situation where you have a public disconnect and also you've got the public are scared. You know, there is a fear, a palpable fear of crime. And it's not necessarily correct because if you look at the crime figures the crime stats crime is actually lower than it's ever been although that's probably because people don't report it anymore but um it, you know policing is in a bit of a mess at the moment as we as we know do you put that down to a culture change perhaps a generational culture change or do you put that down to staffing levels do you think well you got to remember when i joined staffing levels were significantly lower than they are now but the output if you like was far higher you know I, I, don't, I don't recall going a day at Stoke Newington without arresting someone it was they were, they were different days it was a vocational job you joined and you wanted to do 30 years in the police or longer you know nowadays you, you hear of you know youngsters joining the police and they see it as a two-year career you know and move on to something else it's it's a different the whole thing is set up differently and it's evolved and developed into something that's very, very different to what I remember. Would quality over quantity be a fair statement from yeah. the time you were in the police? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you, um, I, I was talking to someone the other day as a, as a young detective, uh, when I first went to my first post in, in Bethlehem Green, you know, you, you ran informants and you knew probably 80%, 90% of what was going on, who was doing what on your ground. You couldn't do anything about it all the time. You didn't have the evidence, but you knew you had that level of knowledge about criminality that was taking place. I don't think that exists anymore. They don't run informants in the way they used to. Uh, they're very much more reliant on technology to do the job. So 
from my perspective, my own personal opinion, I think I think they've lost a huge amount of experience and they're not doing the things that used to work anymore. And they're not that proactive. Yeah, I think that's certainly a key thing. And again, you can't you can't jump into the police for a couple of years, really. It's not like working at Sainsbury's. No. You know, it's not just something you can hop in and out of. But one case we are here really to discuss, and it's about the new show that we have coming out, and it's about the Essex murders. So this is uh, available on Sky Documentaries and now from April 15th, 2023, the Essex murders, three-part series exploring one of the most notorious multiple murders in British history, the assassination of the so-called Essex boys in an isolated country lane. So let's just rewind a little bit. Let's go back to 1995, first of all. December 6th, three drug dealers, Tony Tucker, Pat Tate, Craig Rolfe. They're in a Range Rover. This is known as the Rettenden murders, the Range Rover murders, the Essex murders. It's got many, many different words for the same case, essentially. And they were found shot dead from point blank range with a shotgun, I believe it was. Eight shots in total. When were you first made aware of this case? At the time, I was actually working in Essex. I was the... I was one of the first MET detectives to be deployed onto the regional crime squad, or as it was then the Southeast Regional Crime Squad. And I was one of the first MET detectives to be put into an Essex office. So I was working as a MET detective. There were two of us originally, I think at that time, and we were working at Brentwood. So obviously we knew about the murders because we were in an Essex based office, all the other officers in our, in our team were Essex officers. So we knew about the murders. We weren't, um, we weren't involved in any investigations in relation to it, but obviously you, you heard about them. We weren't really involved at all in any of the investigation until much later in May, 1996, when we were, uh, deployed to, um, follow Darren Nichols, who then became the Supergrass. How did the arrest of Darren Nichols come about? Because my understanding is it was drug related, but not necessarily related to those murders at first. Is that right? It is. Yes. Right. There was a combined effort, shall we say, put together by Essex Police, which combined the South East Regional Crime Squad, which was our team, Team 19, based at Brentwood, the uh, National, Intelli uh, National Investigation Service of uh, HMRC, Custom and Excise, who were looking at Michael Steele and Jack Wombs, and obviously the Murder Squad, Essex Murder Squad, and also their proactive team. So they had a drug squad and a serious crimes unit. So there was a combination of people. How it came about is information came up from some covert facilities that suggested there was going to be an importation of drugs into the UK from Holland. And it was, the information was that it was going to be undertaken by Michael Steele. And so uh, an operation was mounted that involved Husband's Excise, Essex Police and the Regional Crime Squad. And basically they monitored a rib, a fast boat that went out from the UK, out to Holland, picked up the drugs, and then came back into the UK. And the idea was to arrest those bringing in the drugs into the UK. Originally, uh, the whole thing was completely monitored. So the trip out on the boat to Holland and the trip back was covered by an aircraft with infrared on behalf of Custom Excise. I remember seeing the video of that. Where it went wrong initially was that the importation was meant to come into Point Clear, which is further up the coast. So all of the customs and excise officers were effectively waiting at Point Clear for the importation to come in. In reality, the boat came to Point Clear and then followed the coast down into Clacton and onto the beach in Clacton, which there was then an exchange on the beach and the drugs were taken out of the rib, put into the Land Rover and then drove off through Clacton. All of that was captured on video, literally from the aircraft. And I remember seeing it. And it was that following day or that day that we were deployed as a surveillance team and a surveillance capability to go to the Braintree area. We were told not to go to, right to Braintree Police Station to brief. And so we briefed in a Sainsbury's car park and we were then 
deployed to follow Darren Nichols around. And Darren Nichols uh, was kept under surveillance by ourselves. He had a number of meetings and he picked up a parcel. And uh, basically he was followed, two cars, one in front of the other, and they had a, a parcel of drugs, which from other intelligence sources suggested they were in the cars. We arranged for the cars to be stopped by, by traffic officers, uniformed officers, to avoid us being shown out as you know involved in surveillance. And that's where my, my story sort of starts to become a bit unusual because uh, it wasn't until many years later, four years ago, that when I, I was speaking to one of the lawyers, they started asking me about the actual stop and it, going back and remembering it, something wasn't right about it. Because, for instance, Darren Nichols was out and he was on the phone on his mobile telephone. They were allowing him to make a telephone call, which is bizarre. They couldn't find the drugs, 10 kilos of cannabis. And in the end, frustration sort of built up. And I drove down, personally down, pulled up, pretended I was passing, got out. And we ended up taking over the search of the vehicles. And you know, literally behind the driver's seat was a, a toolbox with 10 kilos of cannabis in it plainly on site. So why no one found it was a bit of a question mark. And then at that point, I remember sort of saying, well, who's allowed him to make a phone call? And he was on the phone. I now know, and I knew at the time, uh, he was on the phone to the police officer, his handler, and he was also on the phone to Mickey Steele. And that's always been a massive question mark for me. Number one, why didn't they find the drugs? Number two, why was he on the phone? Cut long story short, uh, I arrested him for the 10 kilos of cannabis. He was taken back to the police station. And that's where the events of Rettenden started to unfold because he was interviewed twice by Essex police. My involvement ceased. I literally wrote up my evidence and passed it over to Essex police. Essex police interviewed him on two occasions. He made no comment interviews with a solicitor present. And then he asked to see a senior officer. He asked the CSN officer, another interview took place down a cell and not on tape and with no solicitor present. And during that unrecorded interview, Darren Nichols then said that he would give information about who had committed the murders. And he then named, obviously, Michael Steele and Jack Wombs as the people responsible for the murders and admitted that he was the driver or claimed to be the driver in relation to the murders. And then that then generated further interviews and obviously in due course led to the, the convictions of Jack Wombs and Michael Steele for the Retina murders. Yeah, they were essentially convicted on that testimony, weren't they? Start of January, well, mid-January 1998, they were both handed life sentences for the three murders of Tony Tucker, Pat Tate and Craig Rolfe. Looking at the documentary series, the three-part series, The Essex Murders, there's a lot of different theories that you explore in there. And by the sounds of it, the testimony there from Nichols likely isn't true. If we could just have a look at a couple of them. The first one which interested me was the fact that he mentioned to someone he was in, I think, witness protection with, that he was coached by police to give this story and he was concerned about messing up the timeline or something? Yeah, we interviewed that person in detail. So Darren Nichols was in protective custody in a prison, basically, within, within a prison wing, within the protected custody unit of a prison wing. And what effectively happened was Nichols, while he was there, was talking to other protective witnesses. So these are people who have offered to become or give evidence against other criminals as part of the case against those people. So these are witnesses of truth. These are people that have gone on to give evidence in those trials as witnesses of truth and have been believed and other people have been convicted as a result of their evidence. So Darren Nichols was talking to a number of these protected witnesses, not just this particular one, but a number of protected witnesses and in those conversations, he was telling those other protective witnesses that he intended to lie in court. He also said that he was being coached by the police. And he also stated that he was being given documents in order to 
ensure that his evidence fitted the cell site evidence and to make sure that what he said in court was going to be correct or fitted his version of events. One of those protected witnesses was a very intelligent man. He was a criminal, but he was a scientist, effectively. He, he set up laboratories to manufacture ecstasy, etc. worked for quite major criminals. Very intelligent man, and he kept a diary. He wrote a diary every day. He recorded what was being said to him. So he kept a written record at the time, verbatim, of what Darren Nichols was saying to him. And Darren Nichols was saying to him, as I said to you, that he was going to the lying cult. He then transposed that onto a computer when they first got computers into prisons. And so you had a written document and you had a typed document and you had all of this material that suggested that Darren Nichols was going to lie. Darren Nichols obviously went on to give evidence and this particular chap didn't pass any of that material over to anybody. And it wasn't until after the convictions of Michael Steele and Jack Wombs that he realised for the first time that it was only the evidence of Darren Nichols that convicted Michael Steele and Jack Wombs. He explained to us that he thought there was other evidence. He thought there was forensic evidence that tied them to it. So he wasn't particularly worried at that stage because he thought they were, in his words, banged to rights. You know, Once he realised that the only evidence was that given by Darren Nichols, he came forward to a journalist and he made formal Section 9 written witness statement saying that you know, he had been told this by Darren and that he then produced the diaries. And at the time in 2002, as part of the Court of Appeal process, uh, CCRC Criminal Cases Review Commission process, they had instructed Hertfordshire Police to carry out what they call a Section 19 inquiry. It was a very, very tightly focused inquiry and it was really about whether or not Darren Nichols was receiving payments before he gave evidence at court in the trial from the media. But whilst they were investigating that, they then came across this evidence. And so they, in turn, opened up that can of worms. They started taking witness statements from these protected witnesses. And there wasn't just one, there were five. And those people said, all of them, Darren Nichols told us he was going to tell lies. Quite incredibly, that material was given to the CCRC at the time, as were the diaries, the written diaries and the, uh, the type diaries. And the CCRC took the decision they were going to do nothing about it at all. And it was never investigated further. And that's one of the, you know, one of the biggest points for us is that there was evidence or there is evidence, clear evidence that Darren Nichols told lies. Why was that not looked into further, do you think? I've got to be honest, Stuart, there's, there's so much of this case that you would sit and ask yourself a question, as a, particularly as a police officer, why? As we've gone through this almost on a weekly basis, particularly in the early days, we were sitting there in complete and utter disbelief. We find it incredible that there were a number of, not just leads, but there was evidence, intelligence, linking other people to these murders that literally nothing was done about. I mean, we'll probably come on to the, the biggest area or the biggest piece of evidence. But um, the entire investigation was, in our opinion, blinkered, literally from day one. So from day one, they were told at very senior level, the people responsible for this are Mickey the pilot, as Mickey Michael still was known. He's responsible. And from that point onwards, their focus was solely on Michael Steele. They didn't follow through on the evidence. And that's one of the, you know, our biggest concerns. One of the things we, we raised throughout the program is if they had a follow through on those investigations, there would have been a completely different outcome. Okay. One take I had from this, I don't know if it's one you've had also. It mainly came to my mind when you were speaking to Steve Ellis or Steve Nipper Ellis. And he was telling the story about his dad confessing that he was involved in some way or, or committed the murders. Forgive me for the detail. Was there a fear because so many people started coming forward for this? Is there any fear that some of them are doing this for clout? They want to be known as being involved with the murder of someone because Tony Tucker, for a bit of context for people that don't know, was a sort of drug dealer in the rave scene of the late eighties, early nineties. 
and he was a known criminal, so he will have had enemies. Was the potential for clout for being known for killing such a person as him, as well as the associates he was with? I think there's a bit of a fallacy sort of, that's been built up over the years. You know, the, the Tucker Tate and Rolf were drug dealers, but they were not, you know, they were nowhere near the level that's been portrayed since in films and everything. They were they weren't being looked at, for instance, by ourselves, the regional crime squad. They would never have got to that level that we would have looked at them. They had only just started to be looked at, investigated by Essex Drug Squad. And that was solely because of the Leah Betts death. They were a local policing problem, really. They had come to notice within organised crime because they were upsetting people. Some of the people we spoke to, you know, they, they're out of their trees on drugs. They believed they were bigger than they were. But they were obviously they were they were up and coming, but they weren't at the you know the levels of organised crime that as detectives on the regional crime squad or even on a local drug squad, you wouldn't have been dealing with them at that time because they weren't at that significant level. So they, I don't think there was any kudos to killing Tucker Tate and Rolf. They weren't they weren't big fish, if you like. Um, I don't think that was the reason for their murders. Do you think since the infamy of the case though with so many films and books about it that now rather than back then people want to be associated with it undoubtedly yeah i mean it's just some people who have made a living out of these murders you know it's you only have to go on social media and you'll see you know who those people are and they've written books about it they've changed their opinions on it and um for, for whatever reason this this murder case you know uh, is still of huge interest to people and uh, I think they're still making films about it and there's still books coming out. But um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, um, you know, people have come forward and they have done so for monetary gain or for notoriety. Do you think the Leah Betts incident, so again, for context, Leah Betts went to a party shortly after her 18th birthday or a rave, one of these illegal underground raves, took an ecstasy pill and she passed away a few days later. There's a theory that there was revenge for that with this, but there's so many theories. Do you think her death has a direct link to the death of these three? The answer to that is probably not, not direct, but it, it clearly, you know, there was a series of events building up at that time, just before December. And all of those event, events, as you put the, the whole lot together, pointed towards Tucker, Tate and Rolf. And I think it became they became a problem they were becoming a problem and someone took the decision that that problem had to be resolved and they resolved it by killing them mm. interesting it's a really sad case that leah betts one i naively wasn't aware of it It was in the mid 90s i was alive but just <laughs> and um so it's uh it's one that's not too familiar with me but yeah that i was thinking as well whilst watching it because Leah's dad was an ex-copper too, right? And he, in theory, had motive. But then he was ruled out because of a, a press conference he did on, on the day of the killings, was it? Yeah, absolutely. He had, he had a, um, you know, an absolutely stone bonker alibi. I mean, there's again, you, you see lots of rumours and innuendo. You know, they talked, you know, I saw, I put a post on the other day, they were talking about um, Paul Betts being a firearms officer in Essex. He never worked in Essex. He was a Met officer. He was a community police inspector. I'd met him a few times when I worked in Romford. A very nice man. Not in a million years would Paul Betts have been involved in it, nor would he have arranged the murders. You know, it's, it's one of those silly stories that's built up uh, over the years, and um, it's not true. So the next thing I want to ask you about, David, is probably what I think you were alluding to when you said the key piece of evidence. I hope it is anyway. And this is witness A quote unquote Can you tell me about witness a right so yeah this this um so witness a was a man who was arrested in january 1996 he was arrested at forest gate police station in relation to a completely separate matter uh and on arrival at the police station he asked to see a particular detective within the met uh, who was not available and he ended up talking to or taking for a a cigarette in the backyard as things were done then and uh, he then immediately said look I, my life's at risk and 
I'm the next one that's going to get taken out. And I was the driver who drove a man to Rettendon on the night of the murders. And that man killed Tucker Tate and Rolf. He gave a very detailed explanation of what happened. And as a result of that, the detective from the Met who dealt with him, who took him for a cigarette in the backyard, phoned up Essex Police. And that day, that afternoon, a detective sergeant and a PC from Essex came down, interviewed Witness A, and then subsequently went out with Witness A in the afternoon when it was dark and asked Witness A to direct them, they took him out of the police car, direct them to the venue where he says, or the route he says he took on the night of the murders to show them where he'd gone. And Witness A took them on a, a long drive and explained to them what happened in his, you know, his account, effectively, of what happened. And he basically says that he picked up a stolen car on false plates from an address in Canning Town. He said that uh, he drove to Palms Motel on the A127, where a man came out carrying a bag who was known to him, got into the car, passenger seat of the car. He then drove to a taxi office in Upminster, where that man got out and met a, another man and was handed a Browning pistol. And they then drove to an area known as Battlesbridge, which is not far from Rentendon, where they sat in the car park for a period of time. And then at a particular time, they then left and drove. And this is where it gets interesting. They drove down to, there's a what's called the Rentendon Turnpike, big roundabout. And as you come down to it, effectively, if you go straight across, you go to Rentendon and Workhouse Lane where the murders took place. He says, no, we didn't go that way. He said, we took the next exit. And the next exit, if you follow it on a map, goes away from Rettendon, goes away. But what's interesting, he says, as he drove along, he says there were some greenhouses, some road furniture that he identified. He says, at this particular point, I turned left and I drove down an unmade road, single track, unmade road. And towards the end of that road, he said, I stopped the passenger guy for a period of time. And then he crossed, he got over a, a gate and walked across a field. He says he was gone about 30, 40 minutes and then he came back. When he had set off, he had one bag and in that bag was a pump action shotgun. And when he returned, he had two bags. Uh, so he had a bag with the pump action shotgun and the pistol. And he had a second bag that contained four kilos of cocaine. He then describes how he then drove back and the route he took back. And he's very, 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 very detailed in what he says. And when you follow through what he's saying, and it's all spot on, the road furniture, everything that he describes is spot on. Bear in mind, on the night he takes the police out, it's inclement weather, it's raining, it's foggy, uh, it's, it's horrible. So he's managed to find that road and he's managed to show them that route having never been there before. Uh, and even when we went down to, to examine that route, we drove past it twice. So he, he, you know, he, done, you know, he found this route. And, and interestingly, one of our Essex officers who works with us, he said, you know, the route that he took and the distance between where he dropped him off and the murder scene across the fields, no one had realised how close that was. So effectively, his version of events is that the chap got out of the car, walked across the fields to Workhouse Lane, coming in from the other direction, and shot Tucker Tate and Rolf dead and stole four kilos of coke. And that the arrangement for Tucker Tate and Rolf to be down that lane was to do a drugs deal for four kilos of cocaine. That was the lure to get them there. He then gives details about what happened, how he drove back, how he met up, handed over the drugs to uh, another individual describes in very graphic detail the car and he then describes how the following day he attended a bar in Woodford and collected five thousand pounds cash for his work or his role in driving so that was the first day he then goes on to do a series of interviews one of which bizarrely the tapes break and there is no record of that interview anywhere the other two interviews are very detailed and corroborate what he says happened at Rettendon. He was taken out for a second time to the scene 
after being uh, uh, kept in custody for a couple of days. And where it gets interesting there is that in that last day that he was in custody, he effectively admits that he knew that they were going to be murdered in advance. At that point, he should have been arrested for murder or conspiracy to murder. Mm -hmm. What actually happened was nothing. They did nothing. They released him back to the Met. And what's quite interesting is um, that come out from the, the program is that the SIO, Ivan Dibley, claims he's never heard a witness say. And we also spoke to the person who made the, um, the written entry that effectively writes off his evidence. And again, that lady was a DI at the time. She says, I've never heard of witness A. So you've got this bizarre scenario where you, you know, in January, five months before the arrest of Darren Nichols, Michael Steele and Jack Wilms, you've got a man who is a very credible witness giving a very credible and compelling account of the murders. And the SIO, the man running the investigation, says, I've never heard of him. Don't know what he's talking about. The DI on the job says, never heard of him. Don't know what he's talking about. And yet you've got evidence. You've got two scene visits with officers' notes, and you've got two interviews and a third interview that mysteriously the tape breaks. When you combine all that together, you would have expected that there would have been fireworks going off, particularly when you see who he was talking about. The people he, were he was talking about, the names that he was mentioning, were major criminals in the Met who were being targeted at the time. Now, if someone had just picked the phone up to the Met and said, we've got this chap in custody, witness A, number one, no one done any checks on witness A, because if they had have done, they'd have realised that he, in, he himself was quite significant. And secondly, if they picked the phone up and said to anyone in the Met, what do you know about A, B, C and D, fireworks would have gone off because all of those people were linked to serious and organised crime, other murders and importantly, police corruption. No one did that. They literally ignored everything he said. And it wasn't until we started our inquiries three, four years ago, that one of the, um, one of the important factors that he talks about is the motive for the murders. He describes about the lure to get them down the lane for the four kilos. But he says one of the principal reasons why they were murdered was because Tony Tucker had stolen money from an armed robbery. And when we first started, it didn't make any sense. As we start investigating, talking to people, talking to uh, Essex officers, Met officers, flying squad officers at the time, we uncovered the fact that there was an armed robbery, that the, the, the detail he was giving did relate to a real armed robbery, an armed robbery where £495,000 cash was stolen. And it does appear on the face of it, when you look at it, that there is very compelling evidence that that was probably the final nail in the coffin for Tucker, Tate and Rolf, and that that was the motivation. And that was the motive put forward by Witness A, and that was probably the, the final reason, if you like, that they, they were murdered. And it's all corroborated. So everything that Witness A talks about is corroborated. He doesn't tell the entire truth. We've never said that everything he says is completely true. There are bits of what he says where he's overheard other conversations and he's given his interpretation of what was said, and that's clearly wrong. But we've managed to get behind that and we know why he said what he said and, and, and we understand it. But, you know, the, the bottom line here is that in January 1996, you had uh, a very credible witness to the murders who was completely ignored. He went on to give evidence at the trial. So the defense found out about him and his account about two weeks before the trial, it was never disclosed. They asked for him to be brought to court to give evidence and he came to court. He was serving in prison at the time. He came to court, he wasn't given the usual benefit of being able to read his statement and everything else. And he, was sworn in and under oath he gave or started to give his story started to tell the story the judge the trial judge at the time closed him down immediately and refused to hear his evidence they claimed that it was hearsay evidence and he was unable to mention any of the name the names that he put forward or give any further details and as a result of which 
he wasn't believed. The jury didn't believe what he was saying. But what you did have at the time, and if Essex police had done their job properly, you would have had two, effectively two accounts. You'd have had the Darren Nichols account, which is, you know, the car mechanic with no previous history of violence, no links to firearms, killed three men in cold blood with no motive, compared to the armed robbery, serious and organised crime, detailed and compelling evidence of being the driver, detailed and compelling evidence of the man who actually carried out the murders. If the jury had been given both versions of events, very unlikely they would have convicted Michael Steele and Jack Holmes. It certainly is an interesting case and it's an even more interesting series. It's available on Sky Documentaries and now from April 15th. It's called The Essex Murders. David's in there, he's got his investigation in there, his team, they go on the the route from from what from the pub to the location. And there's loads of other theories that we haven't covered on this podcast, so I highly urge you to check it out. April 15th, the Essex Murders on Sky Documentaries and now. David, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thanks a lot for your time. Anything any final words before we finish? No, none at all. Thank you for your time. Well, good luck with the show and for everyone else. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next week.